Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. As we recognize the one year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, multiple groups are doing their part to help displaced Ukrainians, including over $27 million from the Alberta government. The federal government announced a new health care deal with yet another province. We will explain. And we hear how a Christian organization is having a huge impact in Turkey and Syria following devastating earthquakes, which affected millions of people. Your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Today marks the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Groups like the Project Sunflower Aid Society in Lethbridge and Samaritan's Purse Canada have continued to help displaced Ukrainians during the war. Hundreds of thousands of civilian and military casualties have been reported so far. As BCN's Micah Quinn explains, each organization talked about how they are offering support during this very difficult time. That includes a multi-million dollar funding announcement by the Alberta government. With more than $27 million being announced here today, I'm confident that we will be uh, able to make life better for those coming from Ukraine to be able to settle here and have a good life here in Alberta. If budget 2023 passes, the funding from the Alberta government will be used to help Ukrainian evacuees access settlement, language, housing, and financial support. Here in Lethbridge, it's estimated that around 200 Ukrainian families have arrived in our city since the conflict began. A candlelight vigil will be held tonight at City Hall to commemorate and show support for Ukrainians. Staff from the Project Sunflower Aid Society outlined what people can bring to the event. Folks can bring candles. Because it's Lethbridge, uh, you might want to bring just some sort of battery-operated a version of a candle maybe or some kind of light bundle up because it might be a little bit cold it's your blue and yellow colors your blue and yellow flags uh your friends your family you just come and show some support we'll do a flag raising and we can sort of go get warm somewhere else within 24 hours of the invasion samaritan's purse canada sent staff to ukraine to figure out exactly what was needed since then an emergency field hospital has been set up with around 100 workers exactly one year later the group continues to help provide support and officials with a christian organization told us what they are doing to help displaced ukrainians since then we've also started distributing uh, clothing, uh, emergency food, um, uh, clean cook stoves, um, particularly because uh, it's now coming on to really serious winter there. Um, and so there's a whole issue of folks freezing to death in the middle of all this. So we want to make sure that uh, we can do what we can um, to alleviate that. According to the Alberta government, more than 8 million Ukrainians have fled their country and close to 22,000 have made their way to our province, with more expected to come. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Canada's ambassador to Ukraine says there's no space for reflection on the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion. Larissa Galadza says Ukrainians are still living the reality of war each and every day. She says while there may not be a lot of joy, many remain hopeful and determined. Ukrainians are still, they're in a state of war. The anniversary, I think, increased anxiety levels. We saw that. We saw that in the Ukrainians around us. But it's not a time, from what I can tell from the Ukrainians that I've spoken to, it's not a time yet for reflection. There are still um, some 7 million people displaced in this country. Uh, these, and, and, and many of them will not be able to go home for years. Alberta's Auditor General says staff shortages led to major care home problems during the COVID-19 pandemic. Doug Wiley's report examined how health officials and those in our province's 355 continuing care homes coped during the first eight months of COVID in 2020. During that time, there were 379 reported COVID outbreaks, more than 8,300 cases, and 1,042 deaths in care homes. He says staff shortages were by far the most common problem. The Alberta NDP say they have a plan to modernize primary care here in the province. Opposition health critic David Shepard says the only way many Albertans can access health care right now is by going to an emergency room or by calling an ambulance. He says more Albertans need access to a physician. Our plan is based on what is needed now. 
and is designed to build for the future as well. Prospective medical students want more team-based care and family medicine, similar to the interprofessional work that takes place in hospitals. Changes in investment in primary care must support a model that new health care workers want to participate in. Our plan is built on continued consultation and implementation with health care workers, communities, and experts. If elected, we're committed to working with doctors and health care workers to reform primary care. We will not take the UCP's path of working against them. Another week of adjournments took place today involving the Lethbridge parents charged in the sexual assault of their baby daughter. Defense counsel for the mother involved told the court that they need more time to work out details of a bail release before an actual hearing can move ahead. The father accused, who hasn't had his case in court since the beginning of February, did not make an appearance. His defense team says they were continuing to have discussions with prosecutors. Neither can be named as there's a publication ban in effect. Both accused remain in custody at the Lethbridge Correctional Centre. The mother's case will be back in court on March the 3rd, while the father's case will be heard again on March 17th. Fire crews remain on scene of a fire not far from the courthouse in downtown Lethbridge by 2nd Avenue and 5th Street South. Emergency crews from four stations responded to the fire at Studio 54 Nightclub and the Lethbridge Hotel around 2 a.m. When they arrived, they found flames coming from the top of the vacant building that is more than 120 years old. 28 firefighters worked quickly to extinguish the blaze. The building sustained extensive damage, and as a result, the decision was made to demolish the building. The cause of the blaze is still under investigation. 19 firefighters were also called to a fire at the Holiday Inn on Mayor McGrath Drive South, also on Friday morning. Fire officials say when they arrived at 1 in the morning, they were directed to a fire in a room on the third floor. One person was rescued and taken to Chinook Regional Hospital with unspecified injuries. Crews were able to quickly put out the blaze. The smoke and the water damage as a result of the sprinkler system being activated caused around a million dollars in damage. The cause of this fire is also under investigation. Professional bull riders endure harsh injuries until sometimes they physically can't compete anymore. Chad Hartman, a bull rider from Lancer, Saskatchewan, will be competing in the upcoming PBR Canada Elite Cup Series here in Lethbridge at the beginning of March. He offered up some tips on how to stay on for that eight-second ride. Hartman also talked about some of the worst injuries he sustained in his career. Lately, I haven't had too many bad injuries. Uh, when I was young, I got hurt steer riding, but like what you do before you bull ride. And I'd collapsed uh, my lung, bruised my heart, cut my spleen and liver, uh, broke a couple ribs. But that would be my worst injury. But late, as of lately, I mean, you get bumps and bruises every weekend. And the odd time you'll get a bone fracture or an injury like that that you just kind of continue on with. And for staying on the bull, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even know because sometimes I can't even stay on them. But it's I would say it's 90% mental. You got to tell yourself that you can stay on that thing. That takes a special person to ride a bull like that. By the way, the Elite Cup Series will take place March 3rd and 4th at the NMAX Centre here in Lethbridge. While the extreme cold warning from Environment Canada has finally ended for Lethbridge, fortunately the mercury is climbing. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early peek at the forecast. Jeanette, it appears as though a much warmer weekend is shaping up. Yeah, and it couldn't come at a better time either. Now we can plan a nice uh, ski day or some outdoor activities for the weekend as, as it is going to warm up quite a bit. Into this evening though, we are still looking at a wind chill value of minus 24 and then overnight minus 18 with a wind chill. So into Saturday morning, we are still going to feel those wind chill values coupled with a 60 kilometer per hour wind. Uh, so still going to feel a bit chilly, but warming up to one degree on a Saturday. And then after that, it's going to warm up even more. I'll be back later in the show to give you that Sunday forecast. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. The federal government announced a health care deal with Manitoba. It comes a day after announcing deals with Ontario and the four Atlantic provinces. It says the agreement in principle will see Ottawa invest more than $6.7 billion in the province's health care system over the next 10 years. To access the funding, the provinces must come up with specific plans showing how they would spend it and how they would prove health care systems are improving. The Manitoba government says 132 healthcare workers in the Philippines have been offered jobs in the province. They include 73 registered nurses, 14 licensed practical nurses, and 45 healthcare aides. Government officials say they could be in Manitoba by the summer and begin work shortly after. 
The nurses would be hired through the provincial nominee program, which admits workers whose skills are needed by Manitoba's labour market. Ottawa announced $1.5 million in new funding for many of our country's black communities. Minister of Mental Health and Addictions Carolyn Bennett says the money will go to support mental health initiatives across the country. She says it's more part of a broader collaborative effort. I am excited by the fact that even the the not only having mental health built into primary care, but also the mental health supports for health workers, um, but also getting with your help um, the real indicators on mental health and substance use that would be meaningful for you. Um, and also in terms of how we deal with the data and the transparency and accountability of e-health and e-prescribing. So I think it's it's going to be um, really important that you, that you help me um, as we are fighting for the kinds of indicators that would be important. Nations appear to be rising and falling as global diplomacy and power brokers look to be on divergent paths. With revelations of Chinese police stations here in Canada and allegations of Chinese interference in the last federal election, what could Canada do? Professor Christian Loiprecht of the Royal Military College of Canada says Canadians need to see action and a workable plan from their federal government. None of these revelations are new. Everything that's been in the news has been things that have been known for five, six, seven years, as long as the federal government has been in power. The only real difference that we see here uh, is the fact that it is now making national news and that the government now has to react to it. And of course, the government is on the back foot here. And so the way government, I think, is trying to um, craft the narrative is that uh, somehow they are surprised and that uh, uh, somehow they're going to be more forceful. But I think we've gotten a lot of words uh, from ministers and the prime minister. We haven't seen a lot of action. Make sure you catch the full interview with Professor Christian Loiprecht and BCN producer Michael Claussen coming up after business news. Federal Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair announced an additional $557 million in disaster relief funding to help B.C. communities like Abbotsford recover and rebuild from the devastating floods which took place in November of 2021. But I want to be very clear, there's more to be done. And, and we're going to continue to work with the province. And as that recovery takes place and as those investments and money has to be expended by the province and by communities, their federal government will be there to, 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 to remunerate re um, those, those payments and, and, and help them continue in that recovery. Uh, we know that those investments have to be done in a timely way. People can't wait years for that money. They need it right now. And we want to make sure the work proceeds in a timely way. And so we're working hard to make sure the money is available to them when they need it. The crew operating a freight train that derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, says they didn't receive much warning before 38 cars went off the tracks, including 11 tank cars carrying hazardous chemicals. They say there was no indication that crew members did anything wrong. An investigation into the derailment continues, with overheated wheel bearings being the focus. We call things accidents. There is no accident. Every single event that we investigate is preventable. So our hearts are with you. Know that the NTSB has one goal, and that is safety and ensuring that this never happens again. Enough with the politics. I don't understand why this has gotten so political. This is a community that is suffering. This is not about politics. This is about addressing their needs, their concerns. That's what this should be about. At least five lawsuits have been filed against the railroad company, with one seeking to set up health monitoring for locals in both Ohio and Pennsylvania. You know, life will never be the same after earthquakes claimed more than 40,000 lives in both Turkey and Syria earlier this month. CBN's Operation Blessing brought some spiritual comfort and practical assistance. As we hear from Chris Mitchell of CBN News, the help was sorely needed by so many families. Behind me is one of the scenes the world has been watching since February 6, when the earthquake struck. This is the city of Karaman Marash, one of the worst hit cities in the region. And for nearly 300 miles, the earthquake zone has left behind a trail of ruined buildings and changed lives. Families like the Dukaklis, about 200 miles away in the city of Hatay. The lives of so many of these Turkish families are marked by before and after the earthquake. 
And we sat down with Phyllis and her family in this temporary tent to hear their story. Well, before the earthquake, I had my own business. I was making bread and pastry. Well, everything was going very well. But now, unfortunately, after the earthquake, I have no job and my workplace was destroyed. But right now, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to go back to my bakery anymore. Phyllis made all sorts of Turkish baked goods, but the earthquake and its aftermath took its toll on her livelihood, her family, and the children. Our fear was too great. I don't know when my children's psychology will improve because, unfortunately, we even had to remove the corpses. Even my uncle's markets were destroyed. We had to remove the bodies ourselves. Things are very bad. The family now lives in this tent. We are staying here. In other words, we are afraid that we cannot go home because the aftershocks continue. Children need education. Yes, that is my biggest concern. I don't know what will happen to the education of the children. After the quake, Operation Blessing came to help. They visited the family, provided food, and examined the grandfather suffering from post-traumatic shock. Blessing upon blessing comes to us. We're always waiting for you. You supported us. Thank you very much. Many thanks to those who did this. We're so proud. We got emotional. It made us even more happy. Also, thank you for coming and making us feel welcome. It is nice. We felt that we were not alone. God bless you. For Phyllis, her goal is to bake again. I hope to continue my work elsewhere, and I will invite you there. There will be treats from me. I make tandoori bread. If we get a chance, we are proud to present it to you. On this day, the OB team came as friends and left as family. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Hatay, Turkey. Incredible story. You know, the Canadian government says we may be headed to a recession this year. Many of us are already finding it very tough with inflation just below 6%. The cost of food and rent continues to climb. It appears as though more churches are helping Canadians through some of these very difficult times. That's according to Pastor Doug Shimoda with City Light Church here in Lethbridge. Pastor Doug says the church can be of assistance in a wide variety of ways. As a church, we try to help people. Of course, we do that through our through our, our preaching. We, we, you know, we, we have offering giving times and we encourage people to follow the pathways of God's principles and giving and receiving. Uh, you no, know, giving doesn't make you have less. It actually allows God to give you more. So it's a, it's a principle of, of reaping whatever, and, and sowing. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Uh, so we, we try to help. Uh, and I think more and more churches are trying to help people with their financial debt and, and, and wealth creation. Pastor Doug will also explain how the church is helping those who grieve the loss of a loved one. We shall have that interview coming up in the second half of our newscast. Well, we experienced more frigid temperatures earlier today, but fortunately, the mercury has been climbing. A full look at the weather picture, including the weekend forecast, is on deck. You know, the record low temperature for Lethbridge on this day was minus 32 degrees, set way back in 1940. Jeanette Roche is now with a full look at the weather picture. Jeanette, it's much warmer now, but did we come close to breaking a record earlier today? I mean, it was pretty cold. My gas-powered vehicle sounded more like a diesel earlier this morning. Well, that's because we experienced a minus 41 with that wind chill. But yeah, in real temperature, we would still be looking fairly close to that record breaker. Uh, it did warm up significantly, though, and it's going to get even warmer now as we look to Saturday. High of one degree. So nice to be back in those pluses up to five degrees on Sunday with plenty of sunshine back to one degree on Monday and then temperature going to drop a little bit on Tuesday with a high of minus seven. We are looking at a chance of snow again uh, back to one degree on Wednesday and then all the way up to nine degrees on Thursday. So uh, we are looking at a little bit of a roller coaster effect over the next seven days or so. The average high for this time of year three degrees average low minus nine 19. That was our high temperature on this day back in 1983 and in 1940 we experienced the coldest on record which was minus 32 seven 25 that is when the sun rose this morning and the sun set this evening at 10 4 p.m or 6 4 p.m rather so we are in that the six o'clock hour 
Harbor. Uh, we are looking at more than 10 hours, almost 10 and a half hours of daylight now. Uh, Victoria looking at periods of snow tomorrow, two degrees the high, one the high in Vancouver, snow beginning in the afternoon there. Edmonton out of that extreme cold warning, but still looking at risk of frostbite and high wind chill values. Minus six the high there, minus four in Calgary with a mix of sun and cloud. Uh, Calgary also out of that extreme cold warning. Finally, not so much the case in Saskatoon though. We are still looking at an extreme cold warning Morning in effect as that Arctic air mass seems to be uh, lingering over that region. Minus 13 the high, but risk of frostbite in minutes as we're looking at minus 44 for wind chill values. Minus 13 also in Regina, same thing, looking at bitterly cold with the wind chill. Minus 17 the high in Winnipeg. Winnipeg looking at a chance of flurries as well. Okay, so let's take a look over at central Canada where Things are looking a little bit different. We are seeing those a little bit higher temperatures, especially in Toronto. Toronto also seeing heavy snowfall, looking at up to five centimeters tomorrow. A risk of a snow squall as well. Minus 11 the high in Ottawa. Ottawa seeing some flurries and snowfall expected also in Montreal with a high of minus 13. Okay, let's move on over to Atlantic Canada now as we see the Maritimes here. Fredericton's high, minus 11. We're looking at plenty of sunshine. Lots of sunshine as well in Halifax, minus 7 the high there. Minus 13 in Charlottetown. And same thing for St. John's, minus 13 the high, but we're looking at onshore flurries. So uh, could be a little bit of a different situation there. That is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities. Providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. Canada's annual inflation rate is expected to fall by quite a bit this year, bringing the pace of price growth closer to normal. After seeing a climb to 8.1% of the summer, the rate fell to 5.9% in January. Stats Canada says the decline from December is the result of what it's calling a base year effect. That means prices today are not rising as fast because they're being compared to already elevated prices from a year ago. The Bank of Canada's forecasting inflation will fall to around 3% by the middle of the year and back down to its target of 2% in 2024. India's Prime Minister urged financial policy makers of the group of 20 leading economies to focus on the world's most vulnerable during talks taking place in India. As Canada and other countries deal with a slew of challenges post-pandemic, India's PM Modi said G20 finance ministers face the tough task of restoring stability, confidence and growth to the world economy. As the G20 hosts this year, India has the opportunity to showcase its rise as an economic power. Modi pointed to the country's digital payments technology as a model to be emulated. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 31 points on the day to finish at 20,219. The Dow was down 336 points to 32,816. The S&P 500 was down 42 on the day to 3970. And the NASDAQ was down 195 points to 11,394. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 93 cents to 76.32 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 14 cents to 245 US. Gold was down 1124 to 181104 US an ounce. And silver was down 54 cents to $20.76 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $11.84 per bushel. Barley's at 912. Canola's at 1825. And corn is at $11.13 per bushel. Live cattle were up 50 cents to 165.20. Feeder cattle March contract was down 15 cents to 189.08, and Lean Hogs April contract was down 18 cents to 86.03. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.47 US. Recapping one of our top stories. The Alberta government announced that it is expanding funding for up to $27.3 million to help Ukrainian evacuees access settlement, language, housing and financial supports. Officials say since the Russian invasion one year ago, around 21,600 Ukrainians have come to Alberta seeking support, with more expected to arrive in the coming months. The federal government needs to do more to protect Canadians from foreign interference, including what's coming out of China. 
That's according to security expert and Professor Christian Leuprecht, who's with the Royal Military College of Canada. He'll explain in more detail in an interview with BCM producer Michael Clausen shortly. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. The world continues to watch the military conflict in Ukraine, wondering how long it will continue and how bad it will get. And of course, here in the West, we are also wondering how much of a threat and issue the recent spy balloons and unidentified objects flying around us are to our and our families. Joining us today to discuss this is Dr. Christian Leuprecht. He is a military expert and professor at the Royal Military College of Canada at the Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Welcome to Bridge City News, Professor Leuprecht. Hello. It's great to have you on. Let's start out with the uh, flying debris in our skies. Can you tell us uh, if these various balloons and flying objects are for certain coming from Russia or China, or could any be any of the fragment of truth to the theories that the U.S. and Canada are using this as some kind of fear tactic to manipulate the public for unknown reasons? Well, so we know that uh, these, uh, probably the first balloon was uh, by a state-run entity. The other balloons were probably by private entities. But of course, the challenge when it comes especially to China is that there's no obvious distinction between public and private because private companies are imbued with the structure of uh, and representatives from the Communist Party of China. And so uh, while China will say, yes, that these are research balloons in uh, uh, case in point is that these are this is dual purpose technology that is being used um, both for research purposes and for espionage purposes. So these are malicious actors that um, you know, how many other countries uh, inadvertently send balloons into our airspace? Look, this is quite deliberate. This is quite intentional. Um, and, uh, um, and I think it's just a new reality of yet another area where malicious actors are pressing us hard uh, in undermining our sovereignty and our sphere of action. Right. Now, in your recent article in the Globe and Mail, you point out that these air intrusions do reveal that we are unfortunately vulnerable to our enemies. How vulnerable are we? Well, the success of this continent really since 1940, um, what is known as the Kingston Dispensation, has really been built on uh, the security of the continent, where Canada and the U.S. got together uh, and basically forged a pact a functional arrangement where they agree that anything that poses a threat to one country also posed a threat to the other country. And so that they built a joint system to defend the continent, the airspace of the continent, but also subsequently the maritime approaches. And that strategy has arguably made North America the most prosperous, politically stable and desirable continent that history has ever known. And so when you're able to demonstrate that actually those defenses can be breached, and you're very deliberately sending a signal about the vulnerability of being able to breach those defenses. Um, that is a clear uh, signal on one hand by an adversary who is uh, intent on bringing geostrategic competition to our own continent and our own skies. And it is also um, a realization on our part that what we have been doing and investing in keeping the continent safe, secure, and protecting our sovereignty has been insufficient relative to both the intent by our adversaries as well as the capacities and capabilities that our adversaries uh, have built and are building um, in order to uh, press us hard in this new era of geostrategic rivalry. Right. That makes a lot of sense because the citizenry can be distracted by work and living and day-to-day -day tasks, and then the governments can maybe have other things on their plate. Can you talk maybe a little bit about how U.S. and Canadian governments are reacting to these newborn, uh, these new airborne threats? Uh, and perhaps maybe a better question is, how should they be reacting? 
So, uh, as you can see, the reactions come entirely from the United States, um, including the first balloon that crossed uh, Canadian airspace, ostensibly Yukon and all of British Columbia, um, without any um, announcement or so from the government of Canada. To the contrary, uh, the only announcement we got was that we called in the uh, Chinese ambassador to express our apparent displeasure. Uh, and uh, I have a feeling, given that uh, the way that China has treated Canada, uh, the Chinese ambassador uh, would have been unlikely to take any uh, lectures from Canadian officials. Uh, at the same time, you get the U.S. Secretary of State coming out explicitly saying that this is a brazen violation of um, our sovereignty. It is a brazen violation of international law. Uh, so you can contrast those two reactions. And you might ask yourself, so why is it that the Canadian government has not been more forceful? I mean, you can also put this in the context of recent revelations of everything from influence campaigns in China, of academics, private sector people, politicians, uh, to Chinese attempts to manipulate our election system, um, uh, secret police stations uh, that China runs in this country, uh, all of it apparently with impunity and all of it without much pushback from the federal government. Uh, so uh, you can see very two two very distinct uh, approaches uh, when it comes to China, and I think that does not bode well for the overall defense of the continent. Because ultimately, uh, Canada and the United States needs to need to be on the same page when it comes to continental defense and continental sovereignty. Uh, and it appears, just based out of the statements and the approaches the two capitals are taking, that is increasingly not the uh, not not the case. We're on divergent paths. Uh, and I think that does not bode well for the strategy that for the for the strategy that has made Canada the country that it is today. Well, this sounds like actually just the tip of a very large iceberg. So you mentioned the Chinese military police stations or outposts, and you've also mentioned the election interference. What do you take away from that as far as how maybe China views Canada? Well, we know exactly how China views Canada, because if we look at last November's meeting in Bali, where Xi Jinping effectively humiliated uh, the Canadian prime minister, um, it clearly showed that China has complete disregard and complete disrespect for this country. Um, and so this is why it's puzzling to me that our federal government continues somehow to try to thread the needle um, with uh, an adversary that has clearly shown that they have no intent of respecting us or our interests. And so I'm not sure how we can actually run a collaborative um, approach uh, with uh, with such a country. Uh, and I'm not sure what that strategy would uh, um, would ultimately look like. So uh, in that regard, um, I think we continue to have these sort of very disparate sort of try approaches, trying to appease China on the one hand. On the other hand, we then come out sort of very forcefully or somewhat forcefully when when it's revealed that China, China is uh, interfering in our affairs in one way or another. None of these revelations are new. Everything that's been in the news has been things that have been known for five, six, seven years, as long as the federal government has been in power. The only real difference that we see here uh, is the fact that it is now making national news and that the government now has to react to it. And of course, the government is on the back foot here. And so the way government, I think, is trying to um, craft the narrative is that uh, somehow they are surprised and that uh, uh, somehow they're going to be more forceful. But I think we've gotten a lot of words uh, from ministers and the prime minister. We haven't seen a lot of action. Uh, the only action that we've seen from the prime minister in response to the reporting by the Globe and Mail is that the prime minister has directed CSIS to figure to find out who uh, showed those documents to the Globe and Mail. So the preoccupation seems to be to continue to control the narrative and to control the message rather than actually taking uh, concerted and forceful action um, to protect um, uh, our democracy, uh, our prosperity, and our security. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I like the way you described it as threading a needle. And especially with uh, the federal government wanting CSIS to see where the leak was that went to the press instead of dealing with what we think is a major issue of a foreign communist entity involved in our federal elections. Do you think that there's a practical solution to this for Canada? 
Sure. I mean, there's there's a number of approaches. So one thing is, of course, when it comes to continental defense, when the government issued strong, secure, engaged, its defense policy that it is now looking to update in 2017, it explicitly excluded NORAD renewal. Um, and NORAD, of course, is the organization that uh, has been tasked since 1957 uh, as a functional joint operational arrangement to protect the, 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 the sovereignty and security of the continent. Uh, so it is puzzling that at a time of geostrategic competition, um, uh, Canada would not double down on the protection of the continent. Um, foreign uh, agent registries as have been implemented by both Australia and the UK that anybody who uh, directly or indirectly lobbies on the part of a foreign government needs to register uh, doing so. Uh, there's a whole host of reasons why you would want to do that. But one of it is simply that some of the activities that China is engaged in can be very difficult to prove in court and can be very difficult to convict people for. So if you have a foreign agent registry, at that point, it becomes relatively easy to take action against people because you don't need to prove higher sort of thresholds of, for instance, violation of election law or criminal law, for instance. You can simply show that, well, you violated, uh, you fi you violated the foreign agent registry. And so it comes with a whole bunch of, sort of uh, bunch bunch of restrictions that allows you to control this type of activity. Right. Look, um, if the if the reporting is correct by the Globe and Mail, um, then CSIS was well aware of um, at least a senior Chinese diplomat in this country being actively engaged and directing activities that were meant to interfere with. Um, a Canadian federal election um, and our democratic institutions. The government has the opportunity to um, declare that person persona non grata and evict them from the country if they are a diplomat. Again, right. the government kind of did nothing. It was aware of the re of, of of what was CISA was was uh, was do of uh, was was observing uh, and took no action. We could be having mm -hmm. RCMP investigations, but of course, we all know what challenges our uh, federal police force has uh, simply trying to do the basic day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. So I have relatively little confidence uh, that this organization would have uh, currently uh, the assets, the skill sets, the capabilities, or the capacities to run some of these extremely mm -hmm. uh, complex investigations that would yeah. be required to root out uh, some of the foreign interference. So the government could double down on making sure that um, what is ostensibly our federal and national police force uh, has the has has the, the the commitment and the ability to deliver on those federal and national mandates. But as we recently saw in the report from um, Justice Rulo, uh, the Emergencies Act inquiry, uh, five volume reporting, um, it appears that there continue to be significant deficiencies when it comes to uh, the ability of the RCMP to uh, respond, uh, even in the case of a national emergency. So there are lots of things that the government could be doing, uh, right. but uh, um, it appears that uh, none of these are a significant priority. I'm not exactly sure why. It might be because the government feels that those things are distracting from its own policy agenda that it wants to implement. It might be the government feels that these things are too controversial among the electorates or doesn't want to have that conversation. Uh, it might not want to be poking um, uh, the dragon, uh, so to speak, when it comes to China. But uh, one thing that appears to be clear is that we still don't have a concerted uh, strategy um, and a coherent strategy when it comes to containing um, uh, the challenges that China poses to uh, Canada and Canadian interests at home and abroad. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot. I You had mentioned the word competition, and of course there seems to be a lot of that competition uh, between nations right now. But the thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly before, as we get close to wrapping up, is maybe that capacity. We could talk about the Canadian sovereignty in our Arctic areas. And uh, one can hear alarming information from former military personnel on just how unprepared the Canadian military has become. But can you talk about that capacity briefly, maybe uh, not just about the military, but also the RCMP in dealing with these national security issues? Yeah, so I mean, when it comes to the Arctic, um, so yes, so there's a broader issue of the Canadian Armed Forces that has really suffered from 20 years of benign neglect from governments from both sides of the aisle. And now there's so many fires that are burning, I think, that the government is having a hard time to figure out 
um, where what to deal with first and really what the organization needs is a 15-year probably reconstitution plan to rebuild uh, the organization so it can perform for the government and can perform for Canadians. But the broader challenge is still sort of looking at this in siloed approaches. So when we look at Arctic, we look at Arctic defense, for instance. Rather than understanding what the, the weaknesses that our adversaries are exploiting quite systematically when it comes to our political institutions, our economy, our diplomacy, cyberspace, and uh, that what you've been mentioning and what we've been observing is simply part of a broader pattern of our adversaries using what is known as gray zone activities, hybrid warfare uh, activities below the threshold of armed conflict um, to undermine us. Um, and so what we really need is a whole of government approach to deal with these challenges and a whole of society approach to make our society resilient uh, against these types of attempts at interference. And I think as long as we continue to try to deal with these and sort of siloed uh, capabilities or simply make this a defense problem or a security problem or so, uh, we're uh, going to continue to fall short um, and we will continue to leave uh, significant cracks in the system for our adversaries to uh, to exploit. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good way to look at it and that approach, uh, and definitely a long-term sustainability or uh, reboot plan. But uh, thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Leuprecht. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Christian Leuprecht is a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada at the Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Many would argue that families in the church have been the bedrock of our communities for generations. But you know, as people mature in attitudes and values and webs sometimes flow, the family unit and churches continue to provide a solid foundation for communities, but sometimes those families struggle within communities. Joining us to chat about it and how the family and church still impact our health of our communities is Pastor Doug Shimoda with City Light Church here in Lethbridge. Pastor Doug, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Now, Pastor Doug, in your opinion, what benefits does the family unit really bring to our community? You know, you got to look at the Bible. And the Bible says that God actually puts um, the lonely people into families. That's Psalm 68, verse 6. And the family unit really helps us to experience less loneliness, I believe. When you think about it, life is it's all about relationships. And the family is God's microcosm. Um, is his ordained way to do life, you know, uh, so our family can help us through the worst of times and the best of times. And I, I believe it's all about trying to build healthy bonds in, in, in a family and that um, bonds of love that support and promote, you know, good mental health, emotional health. Yeah, and if you look at all the studies, you'll find that spending time with family is so important because it actually helps to reduce anxiety and stress. Um, you know, and right now, it's so important that we have face-to-face uh, -face communication and, as opposed to digital, digital, you know, and just face-to-face -face communication really helps to uh, reduce times of anxiety, depression, uh, mental health, and it, 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 it helps us in so many ways physically as well. Uh, we think about uh, families spending more time eating meals. I mean, meals are healthier made at home than bought at a fast food restaurant, uh, we think about uh, family times where we get together, uh, do sports outside, hiking, get uh, gardening. Uh, all that helps to improve our our our, our physical health, uh, our heart, our brain, um, our, our hormonal, uh, immunal health. Yeah, you combine all those benefits, mental, physical, emotional benefits of family, and you see why family time is so important to uh, for us, so that we can live a longer. A healthier and a healthier and a happier life. You know, it's interesting too in the Bible it talks about no man or woman is an island. And like you talk about that, human interaction is so key, it's so vital for healthy relationships. But unfortunately, during the pandemic, many people, family members, were isolated, including our seniors. How detrimental was that? And kids not being able to go to school and hang out with their friends. Yeah, th that's so true. Um, disconnection, isolation uh, causes uh, a whole bunch of other problems, mental physical, emotional, um, you know, we, we were created to be uh, relational beings. And without uh, people around us to encourage us and to help us, 
no man is an island to themselves, you know. And uh, so we we desperately need to to seek different ways, you know, ways, and especially through family, but developing good uh, family relationships and, and time, so that you know that's what that's what makes us better people all all the way around. Now, Pastor Duck, can you share with us some of the red flags you've witnessed as a pastor that can kind of lead to a breakdown of a family unit? Well, you know, I, I think probably one of the the biggest red flags would be um, when people get too busy. Uh, it's it's busyness uh, that causes disconnection. Uh, less face to face time is is just really not good for people, and uh, it's one of the main causes for loneliness. If you think about social media. You know, excess social media causes to be people to be uh, less social and less relational than ever. And that's what causes a lot of problems. You know, we get uh, uh, when we get away from from face to face connections and times that that's a big red flag. It's just being too busy. Uh, other things like um, uh, uh, financial stress, financial stress causes problems. Uh, it's one of the biggest reasons for marriage breakdown, too, as well. And uh, so we need to be aware and work on these areas that could cause breakdowns in the family unit. Now, in your mind, how is the church really well equipped to help families struggling to keep it all together? You know, I, I, I love what uh, Pastor Leon Fontaine, uh, he talked about the culture that he developed in his church. It's called Laugh. It's all about love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And uh, I believe that's that's what we need to develop in our churches, and that's how the church can help people. You know, the because people are looking for those three essential things. They're looking to be loved. Uh, they're looking for to be accepted, forgiven, you know, of all their sins, and that's what God provides within His church. And uh, the church is really an extension of Christ Himself. It's His arms, legs, feet, arms. You know, so yeah. And uh, we truly need to be surrounded by relationships. You know, one of the best um, uh, analogies about uh, uh, the type of relationships we need in our lives is is, is like a brick. Uh, a brick within a wall is surrounded by six six other bricks. Three types of relationships. There's two bricks above, two uh, two beside, two below. Well, we need people above us to help lift us up and to encourage us and and to mentor us. And we need people beside us to walk with and encourage us. And we also need to be giving of ourselves to to help other people in difficult times too as well. So there, there are all, those types of relationships are, are, are relationships that we can get through the church to, to help us, to keep it together. And thank you so much for mentioning Pastor Leon. Leon Fontaine, we miss him so dearly, especially around here at Miracle Channel and Bridge City News. Pastor Doug, inflation is still hovering around 6%. The rising cost of living has impacted so many families across the country. What encouragement can you offer people during these very difficult times? Um, fi financial responsibility is a, is a big issue. And uh, um, today uh, we're seeing so many people, uh, credit card debt, uh, so, so much debt, uh, out of control debt. So uh, as a church, we try to help people. Of course, we do that through our, through our, our preaching. We, 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 know we, we have offering giving times and we encourage people to follow the pathways of God's principles and giving and receiving. Uh, you know, giving doesn't make you have less. It actually allows God to give you more. So it's a, it's a principle of, of reaping whatever, and, and sowing. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Uh, so we, we try to help. Uh, and I think more and more churches are trying to help people with their financial debt and, and, and wealth creation. Uh, we, there's a great course that many churches have um, in the, um, it's, it's called uh, Financial Peace University by Dave Ramsey. And it's, and it's offering people a good plan to get rid of debt and to deal with bad spending habits and attitudes and, and learn how to budget and to save. Because we as a church, we want to help people to prosper mentally, physically, uh, and uh, spiritually, and financially too as well. You know, some people use an acronym for the Bible, which is Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, B-I-B-L-E. Now, can you give us an example of how the truths of the Bible have really helped families through difficult times? Yeah, you know, uh, one thing that the Bible really helps people with is, is hope. It offers people hope. And you read the Bible and you keep reading consistently and you find your faith and your hope just, just growing as you listen to those words and you try to put them into to practice. You know, and there's a, a scripture in Jeremiah uh, um, six, I believe, that talks about the ancient pathways that we're to walk in, and they're 
they're really the ancient principles of God from, from, from the beginning of time for mankind to walk on. And if we walk these paths, we'll walk in the places of blessing and prosperity and protection. And, he, and, and the, the prophet encourages us to walk in the ancient pathways, walk in these ways, and it will go well with you. And uh, that's the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, Jesus talked about, about uh, you know, it's the truth that sets you free. He tells a great parable about, the, about two types of builders, the wise builders and the foolish builders. And he tells people to build their lives upon his words. He says, he who hears my words and he who puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So when the, the rains came down the, and, the, and, the, and the streams rose and the, and and the flood and and the and and the storms blew. That house did not fall. That life did not fall apart. Fall, fall apart because it was built on the truths, the foundation of God's truths and God's words. So, so that's what we try to do as a church is to is to help people, you know, in, 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 with, with with just principles and pathways. You know, God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light for our path. So, Pastor Doug, where can a family member go in the Bible? if they've recently lost a loved one and really need to find comfort from their grief, you know, the Holy Spirit's leading comfort. Yeah, you know, I, I believe that one of the best places to go to is uh, start reading the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms is all about dealing with your heart and your emotions, and uh, that's, that's one of the best places to read. We, Psalms like Psalm 23, you know, dealing with uh, darkness and death and, you know, and, and trusting God. There are, and, and there are so many scriptures throughout the, the Bible, like the book of Isaiah, is an excellent place too as well. And of course, the, the Gospel of John, the very words of Jesus, you know, so many comforting words to there too as well. So yeah, the Bible is a great book of comfort. Sadly, I lost my nephew to a, a drug overdose about five, six years ago. My mother passed away a couple of years ago. Many families have lost loved ones. Can you share with us the practical ways a church community really helps members grow in their faith and help them through the grieving process? Yes, you know, just to, I believe that um, that uh, God ordained the church to be a place of healing and of wholeness and building lives and building families. And uh, so we really encourage people uh, to to not follow the, uh, the 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 normal trend of a church of attending church maybe just once a month or you know once every uh, you know statutory holiday, but make it in a regular part of their their life. You know. Being in a worship presence is actually being in in you know, we're in a house of God. The local church is being in the presence of God, and uh, that's being in the presence of God's love, God's power, a place of faith too, as well. So that really helps people. We also encourage people to go beyond that, not just the Sunday morning, but we we're a church of small groups, and many many churches believe in you know and, and having small groups, which are actually care groups where people can. You know, build relationships, uh, create uh, authentic relationships, friendships of friends of faith to encourage one another and, you know, and comfort one another. And uh, it really helps uh, you know, when, when you're going through uh, uh, difficult times. We believe that we need uh, people who care and love and can pray and connect us with God too as well. Now, one of the serious issues families are facing right now is emotional stress due to a lot of the current events in society today just got out of the pandemic. We're going through all of the high inflation right now. So what are some of the things a believer can provide to friends struggling with stress, panic, and emotional pain, and even depression? Yes, you know, um, I, I, I think with, with everything that's happening, um, you know, we, 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 we look at social media and uh, we are so much more aware of all, all, all the negative stuff that has happened. So sometimes we've just got to shut down or, or, or to just narrow our, our, our access to things like social media and, and uh, media involvement and even the Internet, too, as well, because we become aware of, of negative things that are happening all around the world. And, and Jesus said, when you hear of wars or rumors of wars, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, and he also says, in this, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I have over, I've overcome the world. So as believers, we're always trying to point people to Jesus, that he's the one. That if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you know, you're, you're keeping on, your eyes on someone who could take you through, break you through all the darkness and all the problems. And he really is the answer to all the life's problems. Do you think sometimes busyness 
keeps us away from keeping our focus on God too, keeping our eyes on Jesus. You know, whether it's, you know, busy with our kids, taking them to piano lessons and swimming and hockey, and then being involved in everything, but spending time with the word of the Lord. Yes, so true. And, you know, it, it really is a discipline, you know, and, uh, you know, it, and at, at first it's, uh, it doesn't happen easily, but it, it takes a, a great effort on the part uh, of, 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 uh, of a believer in Christ to determine that I'm going to do my devotions today. Often we don't see the value of it at the very moment, but as we keep on continuously, you know, um, reading the Word of God, it builds up our faith and developing this relationship with God through prayer. And we find out suddenly our awareness of God and, 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 and His working in our lives becomes much more vibrant and real. So, you know, and, and that's, that's so important that we do that with each other. But Bible also encourages each of us to spur one another on to love and good deeds. So that's that thing. We just so need each other. We need, desperately need friends of faith. Let's talk about the human heart for just a moment now, Pastor Doug. Do you think that people have the same spiritual need now as they did back when Jesus walked the earth? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, you know, man, mankind is still the same. And uh, God created mankind with a, a hole in their heart that only he can fill by his spirit. So, so Jesus says, come to me. You know, you, you got to come to me and I can fill it. I'm the only one that can satisfy that deepest long is in your, in your heart. You know, I, I created you to have a personal relationship with you. And, and, and all the benefits of that relationship come through this, this personal relationship with God's son, Jesus Christ. That's why he sent this son, because we desperately needed to fill that hole in our heart. And, you know, so many people, they're working overtime, trying to get ahead, trying to climb that corporate ladder. But what is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his own soul, right? When you lose your focus, not spending time with God and your family. Now, are you finding in your capacity as pastor at City Light Church that people in our community are still looking for this rest that Jesus is talking about? Rest and yes. replenish our souls? Uh Absolutely. You know, uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter when you live or where you live, you know, uh, that's what we need. We need rest and people need rest, physical rest, but we need rest in our soul is right. Rest in, in our spirit. And, and that's what Jesus promises. He says, um, he said, I give you a peace and I give you rest that the world cannot give, you know, and we think about it, that peace and rest comes through a person. He's the Prince of Peace. And he's, and he tells us, um, in another, like the book of Philippians in the New Testament is a great uh, chapter. The chapter four says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with thanksgiving, by prayer and petition, give your, give your prayers and requests to God. And then he says, when you do that, then this peace comes into your heart and mind, a peace that transcends all your heart, your, all understanding or guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You know, it's a powerful promise, but it's, it's for us today. Amen. Pastor Doug Shimoda from City Light Church in Lethbridge, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Hal. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.